and in the blazing sun they stand, desperate to get back to Yarmouk, to a home that may or may not still exist. The last Islamic State fighters left over a week ago, but Yarmouk remains under siege. Government troops only allow the lucky few back in each day. Back in to this. It is a devastation almost beyond comprehension. Once the biggest Palestinian refugee camp in Syria, hundreds of thousands moved here, dreaming of a return to Palestine. Now hundreds of thousands who fled the destruction here dream only of a return to home. Like Rania, she's a single mum. Her children are seven and five. Her husband died of a stroke and she's desperate to find her home. But the soldiers say the old route back is blocked. She'll have to go round by a much longer path. So you have not been home for five years? Five years, five yes. years last yes. time here? Yes, five years. It's a long time. <laughs> Friends and parents keep calling. All around, the few civilians allowed in here haul, push, drag, whatever they can salvage from the obliteration of their homes, of the lives before. All this man could find from the rubble of his house, the photo of his son. Soldiers, too, doing much the same on a much bigger scale, using trucks, shifting anything out here of value. We weren't allowed to film them, but our military escort explained, quote, these soldiers are helping the civilians remove things of value. And Rania, well, things are looking up. She's singing now. The songs about devotion to Damascus, keeping the spirits up, frankly against all visual evidence. My school. Just a hundred more yards go left, and she'll be home at last. <laughs> Rania points where home used to be. But she's still got to get there. For years now, the United Nations and Western governments have accused the Syrian government and their Iranian and Russian allies of the indiscriminate slaughter of civilians here in Yarmouk and across scores of other such regions in Syria with cluster bombs, artillery and barrel bombs. Today, though, finally we have the chance to put that allegation face to face to the Syrian army here in the heart of Yarmouk and ask them, why did you do what you did? When you see that this is what your own army has done, what do you feel? We were forced into this battle. It wasn't our choice. It was because of the existence of terrorists among the people and in using them as shields hiding in popular shopping areas. Syria is accused by the United Nations of, and Western governments of bombing indiscriminately, to kill, which kills civilians, barrel bombs, artillery, um, cluster bombs. Why use those weapons on civilians? We don't care about this accusation. We used heavy weapons in the fighting, but a limited amount. 
We used to depend on advancing troops, especially infantry, in addition to some kind of preparation, which is normal to prepare the entrance of our soldiers for our infantry storming troops. But there are many who say all this, the horror, the bloodshed, merely delivered the people of Yarmouk from the medieval blood cult of Islamic State to the police state of Bashar al-Assad. The West says Bashar al-Assad is a dictator, a butcher, a war criminal. What do you say? The president is the commander-in-chief of the armed forces. He is keen to keep the Syrian people safe, more than any Western and foreign country. It was getting late. Our military escort, though, now allowed us to speak to people here out of their hearing. So who did they blame for this catastrophe? The militants, of course, because they came into this area to hide. If they hadn't hidden here, the regime would not have attacked them. The terrorists. I blame the terrorists. No, the terrorists, terrorists, terrorists. God save Dr. Basha al-Assad. And it's true, the insurgents fought amongst themselves for control of this area. But you need heavy ground artillery and an air force to do this kind of thing. And that means the Syrian and Russian government forces. Daraya, al Kabun, Joba, Old Homs, East Aleppo, the ruins of Yarmouk, the latest on the list where the explosions have ceased, but victory feels hollow. <laughs> and Rania, a soldier tried to console her. He said, you're lucky. You have your children. You have your life. <laughs> well, two updates in the continuing war to bring you up to speed with tonight. First of all, in Idlib, in the north of the country, that's a large area uh, to which the remaining rebel and Islamist insurgent groups have assembled, and that's the largest area in the north of the country which they hold. The UN pleading with the Syrian government to allow more aid into that area. Syrian people um, have now clearly deteriorating uh, week by week. Meanwhile, down in the south, um, the Syrian army has said, a senior officer quoted as saying that an attack there by government forces is imminent, of course, with their Russian and Iranian allies. This is the last enclave of rebel and insurgent groups holding those southern territories along the borders um, with uh, Israel and Jordan. The wider dynamic here, of course, that the United States has said in recent days that if Bashar al-Assad's forces do move south, the United States will stand by and will...